This is section six of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of a Sailor Boy, Chapter Two Flogging A Foreign Cruise. After various delays, we were at last ready for sea and under sailing orders. The tide and wind were both propitious. Then came the long expected cry of the boatswain. All hands up anchor, ahoy! The crew manned the capstan in a trice, and running round to the tune of a lively air played by the fifer, the huge anchor rapidly left the mud of the Thames, and hung at the bows of our frigate. Then came the cry of, All hands make sail, ahoy! As if by magic, she was immediately covered with canvas. The favoring breeze at once filled our sails, and the form that had lain for weeks inert and motionless on the waters now bounded along the waves like a thing of life. Rapidly we ran down the channel, and before we had well got under way, came to an anchor again at Spithead, under shelter of the Isle of Wight. Short as was the period between weighing anchor off Gravesend and our arrival at Spithead, it gave opportunity for one of those occurrences which are a disgrace to the naval service of any nation, and a degradation to our common humanity, which the public opinion of the civilized world should frown out of existence. I allude to the brutal practice of flogging. A poor fellow had fallen into the very sailor-like offense of getting drunk. For this, the captain sentenced him to the punishment of four dozen lashes. He was first placed in irons all night. The irons used for this purpose were shackles fitting round the ankles, through the ends of which was passed an iron bar some ten or twelve feet in length. It was thus long, because it was no infrequent ease for half a dozen men to be ironed at once. A padlock at the end of the bar held the prisoner securely. Thus placed, he was guarded by a marine until the captain bade the first lieutenant prepare the hands to witness the punishment. Upon this the lieutenant transmitted the order to the master-at-arms. He then ordered the grating or hatch full of square holes to be rigged, and was placed accordingly between the main and spar-decks, not far from the main mast. While these preparations were going on, the officers were dressing in full uniform and arming themselves with their dirks. The prisoner's messmates carried him his best clothes, to make him appear in as decent a manner as possible. This is always done in the hope of moving the feelings of the captain favorably towards the prisoner. This done, the hoarse, dreaded cry of, All hands ahoy to witness punishment, from the lips of the boatswain, pealed along the ship as mournfully as the notes of a funeral knell. At this signal the officers mustered on the spar-deck, the men on the main deck. Next came the prisoner guarded by a marine on one side, and the master-at-arms on the other. He was marched up to the grating. His back was made bare, and his shirt laid loosely upon his back. The two quartermasters proceeded to seize him up, that is, they tied his hands and feet with spun-yarns, called the seizings, to the grating. The boatswain's mates, whose office it is to flog on board a man-of-war, stood ready with their dreadful weapon of punishment, the cat o' nine tails. This instrument of torture was composed of nine cords, a quarter of an inch round, and about two feet long, the ends tipped with fine twine. To these cords was affixed a stock two feet in length, covered with red baize. The reader may be sure that it is a most formidable instrument in the hands of a strong, skillful man. Indeed, any man who should whip his horse with it would commit an outrage on humanity which the moral feeling of any community would not tolerate. He would be prosecuted for cruelty. The boatswain's mate is ready, with coat off and whip in hand. The captain gives the word. Carefully spreading the cords with the fingers of his left hand, the executioner throws the cat over his right shoulder. It is brought down upon the now uncovered Herculean shoulders of the man. His flesh creeps. It reddens as if blushing at the indignity. The sufferer groans. Lash follows lash, until the first mate, wearied with the cruel employment, gives place to a second. Now two dozen of these dreadful lashes have been inflicted. The lacerated back looks inhuman. 
It resembles roasted meat burnt nearly black before a scorching fire. Yet still the lashes fall. The captain continues merciless. The executioners keep on. Four dozen strokes have cut up his flesh and robbed him of all self-respect. There he hangs, a pitied, self-despised, groaning, bleeding wretch. And now the captain cries, Forbear! His shirt is thrown over his shoulders. The seizings are loosed. He is led away, staining his path with red drops of blood, and the hands, piped down by the boatswain, sullenly return to their duties. Such was the scene witnessed on board the Macedonian on the passage from London to Spithead. Such, substantially, is every punishment seen at sea, only carried sometimes to a greater length of severity. Sad and sorrowful were my feelings on witnessing it. Thoughts of the friendly warnings of my old acquaintance filled my mind, and I inwardly wished myself once more under the friendly roof of my father at Bladen. Vain wish! I should have believed the warning voice when it was given. Note. In the British Royal Navy there have been vast improvements since the period here referred to, and flogging has been abolished by the Act of 1881. Though I have spoken severely of the officers of the Navy, let it not be thought that the whole class of naval officers are lost to the finer feelings of humanity. There are many humane, considerate men among them who deserve our highest respect. This was the case with the first lieutenant of the Macedonian, Mr. Scott. He abhorred flogging. Once when a poor marine was under sentence, he pled hard and successfully with the captain for his respite. This was a great victory, for the captain had a profound hatred of marines. The poor soldier was extremely grateful for his intercession, and would do anything for him to show his sense of the obligation. Our frigate had orders to convey between two and three hundred troops from Portsmouth to Lisbon to assist the Portuguese against the French. The soldiers were stowed on the main decks, with very few conveniences for the voyage. Their officers messed and berthed in the wardroom. Having taken them on board, we again weighed anchor, and were soon careening before the breeze on our way to Lisbon. As usual, we who were landsmen had our share of that merciless disease, seasickness. As usual, we wished the foolish wish that we had never come to sea. As usual, we got over it, and laughed at ourselves for our seasick follies. Our good ship paid little attention, however, to our feelings. She kept along on her bounding way, and after a week at sea we were greeted with a pleasant cry of Land Ho! from the masthead. As it was now near night, we lay off and on until morning. At daybreak we fired a gun for a pilot. The wind being nearly dead ahead, we had to beat about nearly all day. Towards night it became fair, and we ascended the Tagus. This river is about nine miles wide at its mouth, and is four hundred and fifty miles in length. It has a very rapid current with steep, fertile banks. Aided by a fine breeze, we ascended it in splendid style, passed a half-moon battery, then shot past Bellum Castle into the port of Lisbon, about ten miles from its mouth. Here we found a spacious harbor filled with shipping. Besides numerous merchantmen, there were two ships of a hundred guns, several seventy-fours, frigates, and sloops of war, with a large number of transports, all designed for the defense of Lisbon against the French. After lying some time at Lisbon, we proceeded on a cruise to the Spanish coast, and returned to our station. We were shortly ordered on another cruise, and, being in want of men, we resorted to the press gang which was made up of our boldest men armed to the teeth. By their aid we obtained our full numbers. Among the merchant seamen taken were a few Americans, who were seized in spite of their protections, which were often taken from them and destroyed. Some were released through the influence of the American consul. Others, less fortunate, were carried to sea to their no small chagrin. The duties of the press gang being completed, we once more weighed anchor, and were soon careening before the gales of the Bay of Biscay. A few days after we had fairly got out to sea, the thrilling cry of, A man overboard! ran through the ship. It was followed by another cry of, Heave out a rope! then by still another of, Cut away the life-buoy! 
Then came the order, Lower a boat! Notwithstanding the rapidity of these commands, and the confusion occasioned by the anticipated loss of a man, they were rapidly obeyed. The ship was then hove to, but the cause of all this excitement was already a considerable distance from the ship. It was a poor Swede named Luckholm, who, while engaged in lashing the larboard anchor stock, lost his hold and fell into the sea. He could not swim, but somehow he managed to keep afloat until the boat reached him, when he began to sink. The man at the bow ran his boat-hook down and caught the drowning man by his clothes. These, however, tearing, he lost his hold, and the unfortunate Swede sunk once more. Again the active bowsman ran the hook down, leaning far over the side, and he now luckily got hold of his shirt-collar. Dripping and apparently lifeless, they drew him into the boat. He was soon under the care of the surgeon who restored him to animation. It was a narrow escape. We now reached the island of Madeira, and thence crossed the Atlantic to the coast of Virginia. About this time the prevailing topic of conversation among our men and officers was the probability of a war with America, and a feeling of our own success was confidently entertained. As yet, however, there were no hostilities, and our vessel returned, first to Lisbon, and then to England. For some time we lay at Plymouth, where the vessel was repaired and newly painted. After these and other preparations for another cruise were completed, the hoarse voice of the boatswain rang through the ship, crying, "'All hands up anchor, ahoy!' In an instant the capstan bars were shipped, the fifer was at his station playing a lively tune, the boys were on the main deck holding on to the nippers, ready to pass them to the men, who put them round the messenger and cable, then amid the cries of, "'Walk round! Heave away, my lads!' accompanied by the shrill music of the fife, the anchor rose from its bed and was soon dangling under our bows. The sails were then shaken out, the ship brought before the wind, and we were once more on our way to sea. We were directed to cruise off the coast of France this time, where, as we were then at war with the French, we were likely to find active service. We first made the French port of Rochelle. From thence we sailed to Brest, which was closely blockaded by a large British fleet, consisting of one three-decker, with several seventy-fours, besides frigates and small craft. We joined this fleet, and came to an anchor in Basque Roads to assist in the blockade. Our first object was to bring a large French fleet, greatly superior to us in size and numbers, to an engagement. With all our maneuvering, we could not succeed in enticing them from their snug berth in the harbor of Brest, where they were safely moored, defended by a heavy fort, and by a chain crossing the harbor, to prevent the ingress of any force that might be bold enough to attempt to cut them out. Sometimes we sent a frigate or two as near their fort as they dared to venture, in order to entice them out. At other times the whole fleet would get under way and stand out to sea, but without success. The Frenchmen were either afraid we had a larger armament than was visible to them, or they had not forgotten the splendid victories of Nelson at the Nile and Trafalgar. Whatever they thought, they kept their ships beyond the reach of our guns. Sometimes, however, their frigates would creep outside the fort when we gave them chase, but seldom went beyond the exchange of a few harmless shots. This was what our men called boys' play, and they were heartily glad when we were ordered to return to Plymouth. After just looking into Plymouth Harbor, our orders were countermanded, and we returned to the coast of France. Having accomplished about one-half the distance, the man at the masthead cried out, "'Sail ho!' "'Where away?' "'What direction?' responded the officer of the deck. The man having replied, the officer again asked, "'What does she look like?' "'She looks small. I cannot tell, sir.' In a few minutes the officer hailed again by shouting, "'Masthead there! What does she look like?' "'She looks like a small sailboat, sir.' This was rather a novel announcement, for what could a small sailboat do out on the wide ocean? But a few minutes convinced us that it was even so, for from the deck we could see a small boat with only a man and a boy on board. They proved to be two French prisoners of war who had escaped from an English prison, and, having stolen a small boat, were endeavoring to make this perilous voyage to their native home. 
poor fellows. They looked sadly disappointed at finding themselves once more in British hands. They had already been in prison for some time. They were now doomed to go with us in sight of their own sunny France, and then be torn away again, carried to England, and imprisoned until the close of the war. No wonder they looked sorrowful when, after having hazarded life for home and liberty, they found both snatched from them in a moment by their unlucky rencontre with our frigate. I am sure we should all have been glad to have missed them, but this is only one of the consequences of war. End of chapter 2 Flogging a Foreign Cruise